نحمده ونصلي على رسول الكريم اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله today we will be doing our second session last week for the grace of Allah عز وجل we have been able to cover a lot of <coughs> topics on hadith studies the virtue of learning hadith the virtue of the scholars of hadith and the history <coughs> of the development of hadith how hadith was compiled everything <coughs> everything has been mentioned in the on the slides <coughs> today we'll start the our introduction on 40 hadith of <coughs> imam nawawi <coughs> Can everyone hear me? Alhamdulillah, today is our ses second session on Hadith studies. Last week was an introductory lesson. We covered a lot of subjects. We spoke about the importance of knowledge, importance of um, <clears throat> learning Hadith, the, the status of the scholars of Hadith, the history behind the development of Hadith, how it came about. We covered a lot of topics. Today we'll start with our introduction of Imam Nawawi's of for this in general then we'll do the introduction for Imam Nawawi's 40 hadiths now the compilation of 40 hadiths is <clears throat> can you can trace it back to as early as the second century so it was not something that was developed later on, many centuries later, it was developed in the second century. 
It's a very <coughs> early hadith compilation. The first person to have compiled on 40 hadith was Abdullah bin Mubarak. Ahmadullah. You must be familiar with his name. Even in our previous introduction, we've spoke about, spoken about his contribution in hadith. So he was also the pioneer of the compilation of 40 hadith. He was the first person to have compiled on 40 hadith. After him, from the third century onwards, scholars started compiling hadith, compiling on 40 hadith from third century onwards. <clears throat> now, the question is what drove the scholars into compiling 40 hadith? It's very apparent that it was from the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa wherein he says, من حفظ على أمتي أربعين حديثا من أمر دينها بعث الله عز وجل فقيها وكنت له شافعا وشهيدا أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Whosoever memorizes 40 hadith for the benefit of my ummah in the matters of the deen Allah will raise him as a jurist and I will be an intercessor and witness for him on the day of judgment So scholars have given great attention to this hadith Scholars have given great importance to this hadith. It's such a great virtue that by memorizing, memorizing 40 hadith, which is not a, such a great num, um, large number of hadith to memorize. The person, Allah Ta'ala, will raise him as a jurist, meaning if he, even if he's unable to become a jurist during his lifetime, Allah Ta'ala will raise him as a jurist. And the status of the jurist is very great, the scholars of jurisprudence. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will intercess will intercede for this person on the day of judgment and, and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa will bear witness to the person memorizing 40 hadith. Now this hadith, there's many discussion revolving around this hadith. The, the discussion revolving around the hadith is regarding its authenticity. Now obviously this hadith is weak. But even though the hadith is weak, there are leniencies when it comes to um, narrating and acting upon da'if hadith. This is what we will be discussing today. Now, I have, on the slide, I've mentioned three reasons why scholars, um, <clears throat> what drove the scholars behind the compilation of 40 hadith. So even if the hadith is weak, you can act upon a da'if hadith because of the virtue of actions, which I'll mention later on. Secondly, adhering to the commandment of conveying the message and teaching of the Prophet wasallam, like the narration wherein he says, let the one who is present amongst you convey to the one who is absent. So meaning wherever Rasulullah wasallam said, we convey. So the scholars of hadith, they, they've adhered to this hadith. That anything that comes to us, um, comes to us from Rasulullah wasallam, we preach it. Despite is um, irrespective of its authenticity, whether it's um, authentic or not authentic, as long as it's not maudu, as long as it's not very weak, as long as it's not fabricated. Thirdly, the reason why the scholars compiled 40 hadith was because of the number. So if you look at the number 40, which is not a very great number, and it's not difficult to memorize either. Someone has a timetable, someone um, is able to um, distribute his time, he'll be able to memorize 40 hadiths if he has a set system. So the number 40 is an ideal number, neither is it too much nor is it too less. It's right in the middle. So the masses, they will benefit from 40 hadiths compared to larger collections. Not everyone will be able to benefit from um, say al-Bukhari and other books. Whereas 40 hadiths is much more accessible Anyone can study it, anyone can memorize it. It's a lot easier. So these are the three reasonings that I've mentioned. Now, the discussion is on acting upon narrating Da'if Hadith and acting upon Da'if Hadith. There are two points here. When it comes to Da'if Hadith, meaning, meaning a weak report, there are two scenarios. One is the narrating of 
weak hadith and the other is acting upon weak hadith. So there is a discussion, scholarly um, discussion. So now the scholars of hadith have allowed narrating da'if hadith. So one is allowed to narrate da'if hadith. If a hadith is da'if, one is allowed to narrate it. Provided that it is not mawdu' is not fabricated. Now you can narrate it with two conditions. You can only narrate it if you fulfill two conditions. If the da'if hadith is not related to aqidah, any aqidah matters, for example, the sifat of Allah, etc. So if there's any da'if hadith um, regarding the sifat of Allah, regarding any aqidah matters, you sh you're not allowed to narrate it. Secondly, if the da'if hadith is related to any ahkam of sharia, laws, then you're not allowed to narrate it. So if these conditions are met, you are allowed to narrate a da'if hadith even without having even without needing to mention that the hadith is da'if. Now the scholars who have allowed, from amongst the scholars who have allowed the reporting of da'if hadith, we have scholars like um, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Sufyan al-Thawri, Abdul Rahman bin Mahdi, you have giant scholars like them who are allowed. There is also an etiquette when it comes to narrating da'if hadith. Scholars have prescribed for, for us to narrate da'if hadith in a certain way. For example, we shouldn't be saying qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said. We shouldn't say this. We should be much more cautious. Rather, we should be saying ruwiya an Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kada. That it has been reported from Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or we should be saying um, um, anhu kada, or it has reached us from Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa meaning we should be very cautious when it comes to um, the way we um, um, narrate the hadith if it is da'if so that we do not give the impression that the hadith is definitely proven definitely established because it's da'if could be proven could be proven could not be proven so that's why we should be very cautious. So we have spoken about the, narrate, uh, narr the narrating of Da'if Hadith. Now we'll be talking about the acting upon Da'if Hadith. Now, according to the majority of scholars, it is mustahab preferable to act upon Da'if Hadith in the virtue of actions, which we will be discussing. I'll ex explain what this means. With three conditions. Firstly, the hadith shouldn't be very, very weak. The hadith shouldn't be extremely weak. Now, what is the meaning of extremely weak? For example, the narrator has been accused of lying. So this is classed as the, um, um, the hadith being very weak. Secondly, it is under a religious principle, which I will discuss what, what this means. Thirdly, when acting, acting upon the da'if hadith, one shouldn't believe that the hadith is definitely proven. One should be very cautious. Now, what does it mean by fazailul amal? You know, one can act upon da'if hadith for the virtue of action, for the sake of virtue of actions, meaning any hadith which is encouraging a person um, to, do, um, to increase his actions, there's um, rewards promised in a hadith. There are warnings. For example, if someone does a certain act, he will be punished. So in these cases, you can act upon da'if hadith. And I will give examples for you to understand. So now, <clears throat> if you look at the second point, which I said it has to be um, under a religious principle. What this means is, if a da'if hadith comes regarding an action, uh, that action has to be proven by another sahih hadith. So a hadith, da'if hadith, has, for example, came regarding, giving, um, came regarding doing zikr in the market. 
La ilaha illallah wahda, for example. Like when you go to the market, you do a certain zikr. Now, doing zikr in the market, that concept has to be e hadith. This is the meaning of something being under a religious principle. Meaning, concept has to be proven by he had this. Only then would you be able to act upon the dua for this. So the example I used, for example, is mustahab to remember Allah in the market because market is the worst of the places. Is most is the most um, hated, hated. Uh, Detestable place in the sight of all. There's nothing wrong with that. It will not be that. So that is for the virtue of actions. You are acting upon the Daif hadith for, for the rewards. The concept is proven, but what the Daif hadith is mentioning is the reward. If you do this, you'll get this much reward. But the actual action, the concept, <clears throat> Secondly, we'll very briefly touch upon Bidah. Obviously, the Imam Nawawi's um, 40 hadith collection does include the chapter on Bidah innovation. I'll just briefly touch upon it before we start our introduction. So, there's many warnings regarding Bidah. Rasulullah said, Man ahdasa fi amrina hadha. في أمرنا هذا ما ليس منه فهو رد صحيح البخاري. So whoever innovates something in our matters, which is not from which is not from me, which has not been established in the in the deen, this is rejected. This action is rejected. In another hadith, Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم says, وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة في النار. That every created thing, every innovation new, is a bid'ah. Every newly created thing is a bid'ah, innovation. And every innovation will lead the person to hell. So there's so many warnings regarding bid'ah, innovating anything in deen, doing something that Rasulullah has not done, his companions have not done, the sharia has not permitted us to do. These are bid'ah. Now the definition of bid'ah is obviously um, going contrary to the sunnah, going contrary to the teaching of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, either in terms of your aqidah, your faith, or in terms of action, or in terms of statement. So these are bid'ah. The anything that has Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has not said or done, or his companions, you do it, this is bid'ah. So our second slide, is his um, historical background to the collection of 40 hadiths. Second slide. So we mentioned the reason behind his compilation. Now we'll be discussing the historical background to the collection of 40 hadiths. As I mentioned, the, the collection of 40 hadiths started as early as the second century. The first person to have compiled was Abdullah bin Mubarak. From then, from the third century onwards, scholars started collecting um, forty hadiths. Now, there's so much has been written on so many, there's so many collections on forty hadiths that it's very difficult to give an accurate number. Scholars have counted the number to be between thirty to seventy. So, between thirty to seventy collections just on forty hadiths. Some have even some have even gone far as to uh, uh, claiming that the number to reach 500. So approximately 500 different types of um, um, 40 hadith collection. Now, each scholar, they had the, obviously the concept was the same. Each scholar, they, they compiled, they collected 40 hadith, but the methodology and approach was different. That's what made the works unique. So they had their own style and own layout, which made it um, different from other works. So for example, um, 
Abdullah ibn Mubarak Rahmatullah's version of 40 hadiths, it was, you know, it was just gathered. It didn't have no arrangement. It was not according to chapters. And we see this for every subject. The first person to um, write a book on a certain topic, is, is, um, it, it will be done in an incomplete manner. Then later on, later scholars, they come and they refine the work. That's with, you know, all the subjects. The first person to do it, the first person to put the, found, um, put the foundation, his work will be sort of incomplete. But he has a um, big contribution in the subject. Later scholars, they come and they refine the work. So similarly, is the case of Abdullah bin Mubarak. So some have arranged it according to chapters like the version of Muhammad bin Aslam at Tusi. Some have dedicated themselves into the explanation of the collection like the version of Abu Bakr al-Ajurri. Some have focused on referencing, referencing of the collection and commenting on its chain like the version of Imam Bayhaki. And yet some have arranged the collection according to different regions like the version of Ibn Asakir. Next slide, Imam Nawawi's 40 hadith. Now, how does this one stand out from the rest? Why is this one so important, so special? Obviously, it's because of his layout, his arrangement, what he did, um, what others um, have not done. Now, Imam Nawawi, he was a scholar of the 7th century. He came much later. So he had the chance to look at all the previous collections of 40 hadith. He's seen the gap and he filled the gap. Well, he, look, he looked at the shortcomings of the other books and he, um, he was able to um, solve the, um, I will not say problem, he was able to, you know, um, refine the work, in other words. Now, Imam Nawawi, in his introduction, he says, from the scholars, there are those who collected 40 hadiths pertaining to the Principal Islam. So some 40, some, um, 40 hadith collection were based on Aqidah only. 40 hadith just on Aqidah. So that's what he's um, referring to. And some have collected pertaining to Jewish pundits, and some pertaining to jihad, and some pertaining to ascetism, and some pertaining to etiquettes, and some pertaining to to advise is all of which tension. So you can see each scholar they had their own motives, and each of the 40 had this collection, they were focused, they were focused upon one certain area. It was not um, several areas, they were just fo focused upon one area. It was not as comprehensive, as broad. He further states, I intended to compile a 40 had this college collection which is the most important of all the versions, which consists of 40 hadiths that cover all the topics that were covered in the preceding collections. Each hadith is fundamental from the fundamentals um, of the religions, those that the scholars have described as being the basis of the religion or being half of the religion or a third of it. So, so what we could learn from his introduction is that Imam Nawawi, he collected, all of the hadiths that he collected in his compilation, each of them were fundamental hadiths. He covered all, he covered all the aspects of the Sharia, all the very broad, basically. In any given area, the hadith that he has collected very broad, he had comprehensive meaning and held a fundamental position. One second. So the 40 hadiths that you'll find in Imam Nawawi's collection, all of them are comprehensive. All of them have a... Um, central figure in the religion, central position. 
and it suffices. Anyone who studies Imam Nawawi's for it will suffice him in his religion, in his in his deal. He concludes by saying, "I made sure that the narration um, in this forty hadith compilation are authentic, and the majority of which." Um, is found in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim. I presented the narrations omitting the chains so that memorizing them becomes easy and so that everyone benefits from it. The other thing Imam Nawawi did was he made sure that the hadith, all the hadiths in his book are authentic. So majority of the hadith in Imam Nawawi's 40 hadiths are authentic. Some of them are Hassan. So not all of them are Sahih. Majority of them are Sahih. But some are Hassan, still sound hadith, still strong hadith. He also omitted the chain, so you're not going to find the full chain. Just to make it easy for the people to memorize, but it's not easy to memorize the chain. It's not easy to memorize the hadith along with the chain, so he omitted the chain. So broadening the benefit. So as you can see, these scholars, they were very sincere. They didn't, they didn't have any other motive. The only motive, they were not competing against each other. Some people may think there's so many versions on 40 hadith. Was there a sort of competition? No, there was no sort of competition. Each scholar had his own motive. The concept was the same. All of them had the same intention. How to broaden the benefit. How to make it, how to make, how to make sure that the people, they benefit from it. So each of them, they came with their own approaches. So it is, in other words, creativity. You know, when when he, when anyone does the work of Din, he needs to have creativity in his in, in his life, so that he can broaden his benefit. He can spread the he can broaden the message of Islam. So we can learn this from the works of the scholars. So many different versions. So what inspired Imam Nawawi into writing his um, collecting, compiling this book. Same, the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Man hafiz ala ummati arba'ina hadithan min amri diniha baasa Allah yom al qiyamah. The hadith that I've narrated um, before, meaning the virtue of memorizing forty hadiths. So similarly, is the case with Imam Nawawi. Now, some details of the book. The collection contains forty-two hadiths, majority of which are sahih. And he also contains some Hassan hadiths. It contains 12 hadiths that are found in both Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. It contains 13 hadiths which are only recorded by Imam Muslim in his Sahih. And the rest of the narrations are from Sunan Abu Dawood, Tirmizi, Nasa ibn Majah, Tarakutni and Bayhaqi. So these are some um, overview of the book, some details of the book. Now going to the biography of Imam Nawawi. Next slide. So since we are, is part of the etiquette that whenever you study a book, you also know about the author. So that will create more um, importance of the book. If you know about the author, it will create more um, zeal, more love and more connection towards the author. So whenever anyone studies any book, they should know about the author as well. And just to see like what he took him to get to that stage. When you, when you just study the books and you don't study, you know, it's incomplete. It's left incomplete. So you have to know how the author got to where he got to. What did he go through? What are the sacrifices that he, had, he, he made? So you do not look, look at the end outcome. If you want to get anywhere in life, engineer, doctor, you don't, you have to look at how the, all the stages and all the barriers, all the obstacles a person needs to go through. The biography of Imam Nawawi is very detailed, but it's, it's a brief, we're going to um, only discuss, uh, mention it very briefly. The birth and lineage, his name is Yahya, and you can look at his um, genealogy, you can see. His name is Yahya, the, his father's name was Sharaf, his grandfather's name was Mudri. His title is Muhayyuddin, the reviver of the religion, the reviver of Din, Muhayyuddin. That was his title. So the classical scholars, Islamic scholars, all of them, they had a title. So his title was Muhayyuddin. 
So he was born in the year 631 AH after Hijra. In the month of Muharram in Nawa, which is one of the villages of Hauran in Syria. So if you uh, type up on Google, you'll see. If you type up Hauran, Nawa, it'll come up. If you want to get a geographical um, insight, you know, you can type up on Google when, where does it, where the area is currently and everything. It'll be, it's, it'll be very interesting. <laughs> his parents' early life and pursuit of knowledge. So both of his parents were very pious and God-fearing. He started memorizing the Holy Quran at a young age. He also studied fit by scholars of his local village. Once a scholar named Yasin bin Yusuf al-Marakishi for Marrakesh passed by the village of Imam Nawawi and saw children forcing Imam Nawawi to play with them. And he was running away from them and crying while reading the Quran at the same time. So this scholar, he was a visitor. He came to pass by the local area of Imam Nawawi. So he saw children, the children they were, you know, forcing Imam Nawawi to play with them. But he didn't want to play. He was preoccupied with the reading of the Quran. He was not interested at all. He didn't want to play, even child. And he was crying at the same time because he didn't like the children harassing him, forcing him, bothering him. So when this wise person saw this, that person straight away went to Imam Nawawi's father and um, told him about what happened with his son. And the scholar, he advised Imam Nawawi's fa father to educate him. That, you know, I see a lot in this boy. He has a bright future. We educate him. So his father readily accepted the advice. And his father and his parents, they always helped him. All throughout his academic career, they were always there for him. In the year 649 AH, to for further his education, Imam Nawawi traveled to Damascus with his father and enrolled in Madrasa Darul Hadith and took up residence in Madrasa Rouhaniya, which was attached to the Masjid al Umawi. So to further the pursuit of, uh, to further his knowledge, he went to Damascus, the capital city of Syria, which was the center of knowledge at, of, of that time. He went with his father and he enrolled in Madrasa Darul Hadith, one of the prominent institutes there. But he resided in a different madrasa, which is known as Rouhaniya. His pilgrimage in the year 651, he embarked on the journey to perform Hajj, accompanied by his father. Upon completion of Hajj, they returned back to Damascus. So he also performed, it, performed his Hajj with his father. His academic career. Imam Nawawi was a person who was very eager to learn knowledge. He was very eager to learn the knowledge of Deen and very passionate about it. He always kept himself busy in the acquisition of knowledge. His student Alauddin al Attar recounts his, teacher, um, his teacher's days as a student. He would attend 12 sessions every day where he would read the teachers and note down from them that which explains the intricate matters, clarifies the text and being precise in the language. So you can see the dedication and commitment of Imam Nawawi that in his student days, he would go to 12 circles, 12 different lessons, learning from the people of knowledge every day. And he learned everything from his teachers every, in, in very fine detail. Anything intricate, they were all decoded in the lesson. They were all explained in the lesson. And that was his motive, that he wanted every subject he touched upon, he wanted, he wanted to excel in it. He wanted to learn it properly from the people of, of that subject. So he learned every, every knowledge from the masters of the field. He was exceptional 
in reading and memorizing books. So Imam Nawawi, he was an exceptional reader and a memorizer. He memorized the book at Tanbih in just four months. And he memorized one quarter of the chapter of Ibadat in the remainder of the year. So he had an exceptional memory. These are the famous books of the Shafi Mansab. He memorized these books just in just within um, just within one year he was able to memorize um, the entire book. He very quickly attained the love, attention, and trust of his teachers. So much so that his teachers, his teacher Abu Ibrahim Ishaq bin Ahmad al Maghribi appointed him as his assist, um, assistant teacher for his circles. So because of his dedication and commitment and hard work, he attained the love and affection of his teachers. And his teachers trusted him. They, uh, they acknowledged his, um, his, his status, his, his caliber as a student. And they even, and he also, they were also confident over him that they used to appoint him. He was like a supply teacher, you know, whenever he would cover his teachers. So at a very young age. Thereafter, he taught in Madrasa Darul Hadith, Ashrafiya and others. So he also became a muallim and lecturer. He taught in um, very famous, uh, many um, different institutes. His literary work, Imam Nawawi was an exceptional and proficient writer. Allah Ta'ala blessed him in his time and that he was able to do so much within a short span of time that it would take others much longer to do. So Allah Ta'ala blessed him in his time. He was able to, to do a lot um, within a short um, period of time. So when someone values time, you know, Allah Ta'ala gives barakah in their time. When you, when you are do, doing what you're supposed to be doing, um, you're utilizing your time properly, you know, Allah Ta'ala will give barakah. But if you're wasting your time, doing futile things, there'll be no barakah in your time. So he was a person at a, such a young age who was able to do so much, which others with even longer life will not be able to do because Allah Ta'ala gave barakah in his time. He started writing in the year 660 AH while he was only 30 years old. So he started writing from the age of 30 years old, at such a young age. And to write a book in any given subject is very difficult. You need to have, you know, you need to have a very good understanding of that subject to be able to write because there are critiques. You know, it's not that you're going to write a book and you're going to get away. People are going to turn a blind eye. You know, there are critiques. There'll be opposition. So you have to write a book in a such a way that is free from criticism or you're at least with the mainstream. So you need great knowledge to write even a small book. From among his, um, amongst his famous literary works, we have his Shara on Sahih Muslim, which is a very famous Shara, uh, Majmu, Maj, um, Al Majmu Sharh al Muhazzab, Riyadh al Salihin, 40, his 40 Hadith collection, so many other books. he written lo lots of books. So these are his teachers. You can have a look. I'm not going to read them out. His students, from amongst his students, he had many students. The most famous of them, you had Jamaluddin al Mizzi who was the teacher of Ibn Kathir, who was the student of Hafiz Ibn Taymiyyah. He was the master of Hadith of his time, Jamaluddin al mizzi And you also have Qazi Badruddin Ibn Jama'ah. He was another big scholar. He was a Qazi. Next slide. Be, uh, his noble character. So he was a very ascetic person who lived a very minimalistic life, refraining from unnecessary indulgence and enjoying the blessings of the dunya. He only ate and drank for survival that which will help him in his sacred cause, like worship and academic contribution and not for enjoyment. He never married as he feared that he will not be able to fulfill his wife's rights because of his busy schedule. If he was to marry, which will be unjust and, and a major sin. Also fearing that, he, fearing that he would slow him down and distract him from his effort for the deen. So bearing, uh, bearing all this in mind, he decided not to get married. Because on one side, he'll not be able to fulfill his wife's rights, which is a sin. He'll be punished by Allah. And secondly, 
he had, he, you know, he had a lot of responsibility, a lot of commitment. You know, it will slow him down because your wife has has the rights. You know, you need to give time to your wife. So, thinking about all this stuff, he decided not to get married. And there's so many other scholars like him, like Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Jarir al Tabari. He had great, great scholars who, who chose not to get married. Not that they were contradicting the Sunnah, they didn't want to get married. It was nothing like that. They were, the, they, were the, they were in the forefront when it came to the preservation of Hadith. But they feared of forfeiting the rights of the servants. This is the reason why they chose not to get married. So people may have this misunderstanding. <clears throat> his parents always helped, supported and provided for him while he was engaged with his religious duties. His mother would send him clothes to wear and his father would send him food. So as I've told you, his parents were always there for him. And a child, a student of knowledge needs the support of his parents. Without the support of the parents, a child will not be able to go far. You constantly need the help. The psychological support, you know, financial support, the parents, they have to stick with the, um, with the children if they want the children to prosper. So that's a very important lesson. So, you know, even, even when he was a teacher, his parents were still providing for him. So Imam Nawawi, he never changed his residence in Damascus. Whilst he was in Damascus, he never changed his residence from the very day he came. So he was in the same room, in the same building for, for, whilst he was in Damascus. He never changed. He was in Madrasa Rawhaniya. His demise. So it's surprising to know that he died at a very young age. He passed away at the age of 45. Look at his contribution, the library that he has left behind. But he only lived a very short um, he lived a very short life. So see how much Barak Allah Ta'ala has given in his time. 15 years. His authorship, his um, literary career is what? Only consisting of 15 years. And within 15 years, he has produced so much that if you were to go to any Islamic bookshop and if you were to look at all of his collection, you'd be surprised. How did he manage to write so much within a span of 15 years? Allah Ta'ala gave lots of Barakah in his time. They made use out of every single minute. In 676, he returned back to his hometown, Nawa. So before he set it off, he visited his, his teachers, his companions, bidding them farewell. He visited the graves of his teachers and made dua. He also paid a visit to um, Jerusalem. Damascus and Jerusalem, they're not very far off before they were all one part of Sham. So he also paid a visit to Masjid Al-Aqsa and he also visited the grave of Ibrahim wasalam, and then he went back to his hometown. So when he ba went back to his hometown, Nawa, he fell ill and then he passed away. And obviously when the people heard of his demise, people were very upset, they were very saddened. And a lot of scholars, they went to Nawa to pray over Imam Nawa, rahmatullah. So these are great lessons from the life of the scholars, what, what they've gone through, sacrificing all the worldly enjoyments, all the worldly pleasures for the deen of Allah, Azza wa Jalla. And look at the impact, look at the after effect that, you know, up till now, we know who Imam Nawa is. He lived, passed away many hundred years ago, but still we know him, we read his books. So this is what they have left behind. They left behind Sadhqaya Jariya. So all the way till the end of time, everyone who, who reads his books, he'll be rewarded. He'll go into his accountability. Rasulullah so said in a hadith, that when a person passes away, there's five actions that will, um, that his reward will continue to go to that person. He will continue to be benefit from this. One of them is what? Sadqaya Jariya. And also ilm, yungtafa'ubi. And also knowledge that people uh, benefit from. So <clears throat> this is the reason why 
we should be very dedicated, very committed to our deen, serving the deen, conveying the teachings of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even if we are not able to do as the way they did, but at least we have some of that which they have. And doing everything with the intention of Sadqa Yajariya. This is one of the greatest investments. When we are, when we are, <clears throat> when we are alive, we are able to do good deeds. But when a person passes away, they are not able to do. So the only opportunity for the reward to, to the reward to come to our to come to our account is Sadqa Yajariya. Leave behind Sadqa Yajariya. Any good deeds you left behind, it will be you will benefit from it while you are in your grave. So we'll leave it till here today, inshallah. So our introduction is finished. We've done the introduction of 40 hadiths, <clears throat> the biography of Imam Nawi, rahmatullah. From next week, we'll start our hadith. We'll start from the first hadith, which is, Innamal Amalu bin Niyat. So if anyone has any questions, you can ask. On the chat option, you can ask on WhatsApp anything that you do not understand, anything that I just whizzed through, you were not able to pick it up. Make sure you ask. And obviously, you have the slide as your as your base, as your material. You go over the slide, you revise over the slide, and any other information which are not mentioned on the slide, don't worry about it. The other parts, you know, the side side things that I mentioned, don't worry about it. You just focus on what is on the slide. And the other stuff that I mentioned, I'll talk about, which is not including the slide. If you're able to note it down, note it down. If you're not able to, don't worry about it. And plus, if it's recorded, then from the recording, you can note it down. So, obviously, I've sent the slide for the first hadith you can go over the hadith and so that you have the overview of the 